Welcome, I'm Althea Brooks and I'm Senior Director of Lifetime Learning in the UVA's Office of Engagement. Today's program is part of the Community MLK Celebration, which commemorates the life and legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The theme for the 2021 program is, where do we go from here, chaos or community? Check out the UVA MLK website for a list of upcoming programs. Lifetime Learning is pleased to partner with Morvan Farm for this program. Morvan is a 3,000 acre farm owned by UVA. It is designated for teaching, research, outreach, collaboration between the academic and local community while promoting innovative scholarship among students and faculty. Special thanks to Rebecca Deeds, Program Director at Morvan, who have worked closely with in planning this program. Rebecca will join us at the end of the program for Q&A. We have about 900 registered for this talk on food and justice in Virginia. It's a popular topic. Thank you for tuning in from 25 states and four foreign countries today. We are fortunate to have five knowledgeable experts to share with us in this panel. Our panelists include Chantel Bingham, Program Director of Charlottesville Food Justice Network from Cultivate Charlottesville. Tanya Dankel Cobb, Director of the UVA Institute for Engagement and Negotiation, and she chairs the UVA Sustainable Food Collaborative. Basil Gooden, Visiting Scholar and Sustainable Food Access Core of the Institute for Inclusion, Inquiry, and Innovation at the Virginia Commonwealth University. He's also former Virginia Secretary of Agriculture and Forestry. He also is a beef farmer. Christian uh, Kairos is the Program Director for the Virginia Farm Workers at Central Virginia Legal Aid Society. Our panel will introduce themselves more um, fully in, uh, in the next segment, in just a few minutes. Special thanks to our moderator for today, Paul Friedman. Paul is an associate professor in the Department of Politics at the University of Virginia. He teaches courses in media and campaigns and elections and research methods in the politics of food. Paul serves on the advisory board of the environmental thought and practice major and is an academic director of Morvan Farm uh, Summer Institute. He's a member of the University Committee on Sustainability and UVA Sustainable Food Collaborative and serves on the board of Cultivate Charlottesville and the Jefferson Institute. Paul oversaw the UVA Farmers Market Research Group and served on the steering committee of the Virginia Sustainable Food Coalition. Since 2000, Paul Friedman has been an election analyst for ABC News in New York. To our wonderful audience, thank you again for being here today. We received many of your questions in advance of this program. Should you have a question during the program, we look forward to receiving it. Please add it to the Q&A box below on your screen. Our panel will answer as many of, question, many of your questions as time permits. Now, please help me welcome this esteemed panel to share with us today. Paul, the microphone is all yours. Please begin the conversation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Althea. And I want to thank as well the panelists uh, and you, our audience, for joining us today for this uh, really important and quite timely uh, discussion. Um, Wendell Berry, Berry famously uh, uh, wrote that eating is an agricultural act, and that's absolutely true, but eating is also a political act. It's something that we, most of us, do uh, every day, uh, usually multiple times a day, uh, and to a great extent, this political act is uh, an enactment of our values uh, in ways that we acknowledge and in ways that sometimes we are unaware of. Uh, and so I, I want us to think about what that means. I invite our panelists uh, to think about how we enact our values by eating, but also by participating in the food system. As Althea just mentioned, uh, I teach a course on the politics of food. I just taught it in the January term that ended uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And on my final exam, uh, I had the following question. What is food justice? And the answers were all over the map. 
people had all sorts of different responses to this question. And I was delighted because the notion of food justice is, uh, is big, it's, it's expansive, uh, and it touches on all aspects of our uh, food system. One, one definition that I do like is um, uh, one that calls attention first to the fact that questions of food justice play out at the national level, at the state level, and in our local cities and towns and neighborhoods. And I think that's an important, uh, a, an important point to keep in mind that food justice plays out at multiple levels. Um, but broadly, the notion of food justice can be understood as uh, speaking to efforts that uh, ensure that the benefits and the risks, the costs and the benefits of the food system, uh, where, what, how food is grown, how it's produced, how it's processed, transported, distributed, accessed, and ultimately e eaten, uh, notions of all of those things, the costs and benefits being shared fairly, being shared perhaps equally or equitably. And I, uh, this, this I think is a helpful way to think about it. And among the dimensions of food justice, uh, certainly food access is a critical piece. Uh, do people have the ability to access sufficient, healthy and nutritious and maybe fresh uh, and affordable food? How is that distributed? Do we have equal food access? I would note that uh, one of the very first acts of President Biden last week, one of the among the early executive uh, orders that he signed was one um, directing the US Department of Agriculture to allow states to increase food stamp benefits, SNAP benefits, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program benefits by up to 15%. This is critically important now in the context of the uh, pandemic when food uh, security is under real threat. Um, a second dimension, treatment of workers in the food system. And this may be workers in meat or poultry processing plants. It may be people working in uh, 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 restaurants uh, of uh, various or food service in various ways. Um, but it may also uh, involve agricultural workers. And Christian, uh, I think will uh, certainly speak to that. I would uh, again note that among the changes that we have seen in the last uh, uh, just over a week in the White House um, is that uh, um, President Biden has brought with him a bust of Cesar Chavez uh, which now uh, uh, lives in the Oval Office. That's a statement about food justice. Um, uh, third, a third dimension, um, continued legacies of, uh, of harm and injustice toward Black and Indigenous farmers in this uh, country, uh, including uh, the, the important question of land ownership. Uh, this is something that uh, I hope Basil Gooden will uh, be able to speak to and uh, from the perspective of, of his experience, I would uh, uh, point out that Virginia's own uh, Commissioner of Agriculture and Consumer Affairs, Dr. Jewel uh, Brona, has recently been named by uh, President Biden to be uh, to serve as Deputy Secretary in the U.S. Department of Agriculture. She'll be the first African-American to serve in that uh, position. So uh, with that in mind, uh, I want us to think broadly about these multiple dimensions of, uh, of food justice. Um, and I want us also to recognize that many of these issues have been exacerbated by the COVID pandemic uh, uh, to some extent. Uh, they've been revealed, exposed by the COVID pandemic, but they didn't begin with the COVID pandemic. They've, uh, uh, they've been with us for a long time. They predate the pandemic and they will continue uh, after it is finally behind us. And so uh, I hope we'll have a chance to speak to all of, uh, uh, of these issues. Uh, we will hear first from Basil Gooden, then from Christiane Kieros, uh, then Chantel Bingham, and then Tanya Denklikov. Uh, Basil, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much, Paul. And I, uh, you gave us a lot to uh, digest there. And um, you really spoke to a lot of the issues that I hope we will be able to dive in today. 
Um, first and foremost, a uh, little bit about myself. Uh, again, uh, as Althea indicated, uh, and Paul, I'm Basil Gooden. I'm currently a visiting scholar at Virginia Commonwealth University in the iCubed Sustainable Food Access Core. Um, actually, I work with researchers across the uh, university to address complex issues around uh, sustainable food access, uh, not only in the Richmond region, but throughout the Commonwealth. I work with some of the colleagues actually that are on this uh, panel with us, Tanya Dankla Cobb and uh, researchers at James Madison and George Mason to really uh, look at a lot of these issues from, a, from an academic sense. But uh, previously, I served as the Secretary of Agriculture for the Commonwealth of, the Uni uh, Commonwealth of Virginia. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the experiences there. Uh, and prior to that, I worked in the Obama administration. I was the state director for uh, USDA rural development there, where we worked across the Commonwealth of Virginia to impact the, uh, the economic well-being and the health and the quality of living of people across the, the, the state. Um, and I know we'll get into this. Uh, you asked about some of the challenges and some of the complexities, complexities that we deal with. And um, around food, there are so many complexities when we talk about food insecurity and food justice. Um, certainly there are social issues to, to address, there are economic issues to address, educational issues, we'll get into those. Uh, and certainly racial dimensions and discrimination that we need to really sort of unpack and talk about. So again, that's a little bit about uh, who I am, um, a little bit about what uh, I'm currently doing. And uh, we'll get into some of the discussions about some of the issues impacting food justice uh, here in Virginia uh, later on in the panel. Thanks. Terrific, thank you, Basil. Uh, Christian. Good afternoon, I am, uh... Brazilian national, I was born in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, does the accent. And um, I wanted to have, uh, give my career an international perspective. So I apply and pursue an LLM at UVA and that's what brought me to Virginia. <laughs> then I sat for the Virginia Bar and here I am presently uh, the director of the Virginia Farm Workers Program. The Virginia Farm Workers Program is a statewide legal aid program that exclusively, the only one that exclusively provides free legal services to farm workers in Virginia. Our service model is outreach, which means that we go to our clients, different from most legal aids, but the clients come to the office, but because of the characteristics of our constituency, many times they are unable or do not have, a, have access to transportation, we go to them. We usually visit migrant labor camps during nights and weekends uh, outside of workers' hours. And we also uh, have partnerships with uh, other rural community service providers. And uh, we go uh, visit farm workers during gatherings, uh, such as um, after Sunday Spanish mass, where fiestas are sometimes promoted, especially during the summertime, and health fairs. Uh, and even flea markets have been places where uh, we enjoy the opportunity of gatherings of farm workers to provide information about their rights. So we discuss topics such as housing, uh, works, worker safety, field sanitation, health care, employment rights in general. And um, you, as you see from the, some of the pictures that we're showing before, uh, this is an example of the a diversity of farm workers that we receive here in Virginia. We have locals, people that live here year long. We have folks that migrate all the way from Florida uh, to Virginia to perform farm work and just stay here one month or a couple of months and then they might go all the way up to Maine or they go down, uh, go drive back uh, to the south. Uh, and we have foreign workers. We have workers that come here with a work visa to work seasonally in agriculture and then return to uh, their home countries. These are folks that might stay here up to 10 months away from their families because their work visa do not extend to any family members. So they cannot bring families uh, while working here. Um, so uh, the pictures that we see are of uh, campaign distribution that we have last year 
we apply and receive the grant for pandemic relief grant. Uh, and we distribute a total of $35,000 worth of food, uh, diapers, uh, formula uh, to farm workers uh, and, and uh, medical supplies, including uh, health supplies. And uh, we also distribute masks for a total of 4,000 farm workers last year. So due to COVID, uh, the nature of our visits actually changed for this uh, food distribution where we never be engaged before. And I now give uh, big credit for organizations such, such as FEMA and others because it's a great undertaking uh, to do so. Uh, but it was very, very rewarding from the point of view of my job and uh, Get, getting into other dimensions of farm workers needs uh, at this time. So I think I'm going to stay uh, here for now uh, and then we can discuss more workers rights and how we help distributing uh, food justice to farm workers through our work. Thank you. Terrific, Christiana. I definitely have some follow up questions, but uh, uh, we'll wait and uh, turn things over to Chantel. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'm really excited to be here. First and foremost, I am the great granddaughter of sharecroppers, tobacco sharecroppers out of North Carolina. So I always have to give thanks to my ancestors. And I also just want to give thanks and gratitude to the Native people uh, that were the first stewards of this land uh, that we're on today. Uh, so my name is Chantel Bingham. I am the program director of the Food Justice Network at Cultivate Charlottesville. Cultivate Charlottesville is an amazing organization. Uh, we run gardens in city schools around town. We also have uh, community gardens based in public and subsidized housing communities. Um, all of this is an effort to grow with uh, and for community. Uh, we're sharing food. We are teaching uh, children from kindergarten up until high school, everything about our food system and also issues of justice. And then for um, the Food Justice Network, we really are a local movement. Um, we talk a lot about policies that happen at the federal level. We talk about policies that happen at the state level, but really when we think about changing our food system, that work has to come from the local level, from municipalities and work, uh, people that wanna rise up to really do something and change things. And so here in Charlottesville, um, you know, being a city that has grappled with a lot of, of racism, uh, both explicit and implicit, one of our biggest challenges is and continues to be battling systemic racism, uh, obviously in our food system. And how do we really heal uh, when we're doing this work together? How do, we, how do we learn about our past, recognize our past, uh, and, and use that as, a, as fuel for our future and how do we build a better one? And so I'm really excited to be here today to kind of give that boots on the ground community organizer perspective on changing, uh, in changing our food system from the person you are from the city or that you sit in or the rural area that you sit in. Thank you. Terrific, thank you, Chantel. And thank you also for acknowledging that all of us, when we certainly when we are uh, at the university, whether we're on grounds or at Morbin, uh, are on uh, land that was originally that uh, that is Monacan land. So um, I appreciate I appreciate that. Um, Tanya. Yes, thank you, Paul. It's so wonderful to be here with with this tremendous group of people. Um, it's an honor to be here with you all. Uh, so I am. My roots are as a community mediator and at the institute of engagement for engagement and negotiation. My work is really as, a, as an environmental and public policy mediator. And I, I'm in the spirit of true confession, you know, I, I was really completely unaware of, of a thing called the food system until really the mid 2000s. And I was being asked at the time to facilitate different agricultural policies and situations in Virginia. Um, like the issue, I'm, I'm sure Basil will remember this, the issue of what do you do with excess poultry manure in the Shenandoah Valley? Or what about the super controversial practice of spreading biosolids, which is really processed human waste on agricultural fields? 
um, and or the nutrient management regulations and updating those uh, regulations that farmers have to follow. So, you know, I'm in the throes of this kind of work and really kind of surprised when a colleague of mine at the Department of Urban and Environmental Planning, some, someone many of our alumni re may remember, Tim Beatley, he was interested in sustainable agriculture and he had learned that I had written a book in a previous um, life, if you will, about organic gardening and, and he felt that somehow qualified us to talk about teaching a course together. And it, it eventually led to us providing the food systems planning course, uh, starting that in 2006. After a couple of years, Tim bowed out. I was on my own for about eight years. And I say this, and I tell you this, because really they say you have to teach what you have to learn. And, and so of course it was really through teaching this course and meeting people like Christian Queiroz and Kendra Hamilton and so many others that my eyes were opened to different elements of food justice. And that's in teaching is where I began to understand at a deeper level how the inequities have really been baked into our food system ever since colonists came to this land and created plantations that depended in every way on the system of enslavement, which guaranteed cheap and captive labor. And I learned that this system, which I thought was in the past actually continues today in different forms and that the impacts of this system are still very much with us. And I, I learned the many layers of food justice from food security and access to healthy foods and ultimately having self-determination around the sources of our food. So all of this is to say that the more I learned, the more I saw that food justice is in my view, in terms of values that Paul's asking about is it's the ability to exercise core human rights of self-determination. Um, about the most important thing, which is our food. And also in the process of teaching, I discovered others like Paul who had similar interests. And we came together in 2010, formed a thing called the UVA Food Collaborative. And we began to do things that were fun like hosting a food film forum, uh, offering documentaries and panel discussions, but we had a bigger vision. And there was a question around what are the barriers, you know, what are the challenges we faced? Well, our group, our little group, we had a big vision to try to influence our university, but uh, we tried and tried and really many grant writing efforts failed. Um, but in 2015, the sustainability office changed everything is they were creating a sustainability plan for the university and they asked if we would join forces and create a task force to create a food element in our university sustainability plan and that is where our dreams began to come together we were given a platform and a mechanism for moving forward and i'll tell more about that share more about that later the last thing i want to say before i end is is something that really influenced and, and sort of created an ongoing challenge in my own mind and my own values about what we do is something a community, one of the very early community leaders in Charlottesville um, said to me, uh, and she pointed at me and she said, why are you not taking care of your own house? Why are you not taking care of your own house first at the university? She said, all the issues, food security, access to healthy foods, self-determination, all of these issues in the community are also issues right here under your noses at the, at the university. And so that was the challenge. Uh, we're, still, we're still dealing with that and I've never forgotten it. And um, I think that's, that's what we're now trying to do is to put our own house in order here at the university. Thank you, Paul. Great, Tanya. Thank you so much. And yes, indeed, we will hear more about those efforts in just a few minutes. I want to uh, go back and hear a little bit more from each of the panelists. And Christiane, I thought uh, we'd start with you. And um, I, I, I was hoping that you could talk a little bit more about, uh, first of all, you said something like 4,000 uh, uh, workers. And um, uh, one question that I have is, where are they? Um, are they in Albemarle County? Are they, what kind of work are they doing? Uh, and, you know, you're a lawyer. What kind of legal work is your program um, uh, taking on with these folks? 
Thank you, Paul. So yeah, so farm workers, because Virginia has excellent land, uh, are widespread, so uh, all over the Commonwealth. So we have, and there are sometimes specific crops per region. So in the southern part of Virginia, what predominates is uh, tobacco farms. Um, on the uh, eastern shore of Virginia, we received every year thousands of uh, actually uh, tomato plant workers as well. And uh, there are lots of uh, workers that work that traditionally worked in tomatoes, but now it's being more diversified to um, other types of vegetables and fruits over there in the Eastern shore. Uh, the, the, the characteristic of the Eastern shore is that uh, the very few small farms is mostly uh, corporate company farms, big company farms like Del Monte, for example, uh, operates in the Eastern shore of Virginia. Um, in the in the northern neck, we have uh, some corn, uh, some other vegetables uh, such as pumpkins. Uh, you name it. I mean, all sorts of vegetables are a variety of vegetables. In central Virginia, you have berries, also vegetables, peanuts. Um, in, in the northern part of the state, northwest part of the state, like Winchester, we have a predominance of apple orchards. So we receive lots of uh, uh, workers from Jamaica that work in, in that area uh, of Virginia. Um, in southwest Virginia, we have pine trees or Christmas trees. So also Virginia receive a great number of workers to work for Christmas trees, harvesting Christmas trees, planting and harvesting Christmas trees and other vegetables are also uh, come from uh, West Virginia. So we have a variety of crops in the state and this number of 4,000 workers, it, it's not comprehensive. It does not include all the workers uh, that farm workers here in Virginia because uh, we have a very hard time visiting farm workers that are locals. Um, addresses do not list uh, the person's occupation. So sometimes we lock it out and find folks uh, commuting to work like we did in uh, Virginia Beach last year. And we stop them and say, wait, wait, you live here? And you're, yeah, we're farm workers. We, and they were working in, in some um, strawberry fields uh, in Virginia Beach. Uh, so they are widespread, they're all over the, the, the place. And we uh, have a, a easier time uh, visiting them when they are housed in migrant labor camps. So we have barrack style or, tra or, or trailers uh, that uh, house farm workers. The farm workers that come here with a work visa, one of the requirements that the employers have is to provide housing for the farm workers. Therefore, they either build or have these facilities that have to be inspected. And that's uh, another one of the issues that we address housing conditions, because as you can imagine, not, all, not always those housing are in uh, the conditions that they should be, and not always they are pre-occupancy inspected and then after occupancy inspected again to make sure that the, con that the conditions haven't deteriorated and are per code or per regulations. Um, another issue is wage, wage theft. Uh, so some workers are paid by the hour, other workers are paid by production. When workers are paid by production, um, what happens is that it, depending on uh, how fast or how experienced one is, one can make, can make more money or can make much less money than the minimum wage. So, and we're not talking even about the minimum wage for the foreign workers, which is a higher minimum wage in order to guarantee that local workers will not be disadvantaged by the hiring of foreign workers. But we're talking about the state minimum wage, 7.24 an hour, 7.25 an hour. So um, all those are, are issues. Uh, we have workers' compensation cases, as um, some of you might be aware, uh, farm work is one of the most dangerous uh, occupations in the country, uh, the number of accidents and injury at work, including pesticides intoxication, is very high. So we represent workers that have problems, uh, health problems, uh, as a result of their employment. Uh, so these are some of the examples of uh, the work that we do. Um, farm workers are not the recipients of most employment benefits uh, that all of us enjoy, such as uh, 
you know, we, we stop by the cooling aid to drink some water and we think nothing of, of that break. Uh, farm workers have a hard time uh, to be able to have breaks at work or at least as many breaks as it would be healthy for them uh, to have. Because as you can imagine that most of them work outside under extreme weather conditions. And one of the uh, diseases that we address through workers' compensation, unfortunately, is heat stress, heat exposure. So those are some of the examples of uh, the reality of farm workers here in Virginia, and they are everywhere. I'm sorry, I did not say Nelson County, Albemarle County. They are everywhere, very near us there in uh, UVA. Christian, thank you. So, and 4,000 was the, we had a clarifying question from the audience, 4,000 approximately, yes, in this, in this area. Yeah. That, but, you know, I think many, many of us who are so fortunate to be able to, uh, uh, to enjoy the bound, the bounty of local, of this, uh, of this area, local foods from this area. Um, uh, it's easy, I think, often to not remember uh, that, you know, the grapes, uh, for the Virginia wines didn't just jump off the vine. Somebody actually picked them. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Basil, I thought um, we might hear a little, a little more from you about the work that you've done and some of the challenges that, that you referred to. Sure. No, and, and thank you, Paul. And I mean, just uh, again, kudos for the great work that uh, Christiana is doing and, um, and many of the panelists. Uh, what the issue here that we're talking about is food justice. And it it encompasses everything from uh, the, the producing to the, the end consumer. The, the, the big problem that we are having is the disparity and the inequities that are uh, rife throughout the entire system. So let's talk about, again, some of the disparities. And I actually um, want to talk a little bit about from a producer having uh, grown up on a farm. Um, and actually, I would say I was born and raised on a farm, but actually I was born uh, at the University of Virginia Hospital in the colored section. They had a colored section in 1960s. So I came into this world in a different system than uh, many other people. So, but uh, experience in life as a, a black farmer uh, is different uh, than some of the experiences that some of my colleagues uh, may have um, with, with their experience. So uh, the system of producing and the people who actually work and the people who actually control the agricultural process, um, there are many instances where uh, discrimination actually takes place, which leads to a, a, a poor result for many people that are in uh, various communities, specifically low income communities and communities of color. Now, for example, uh, my father was a, a farmer and uh, my grandparents were farmers as well. We currently still, my family currently still farm. Uh, one of the pictures that I had actually in the introduction uh, was actually of one of our farm hands, um, a, a, a white farmer, and he's a tremendous guy and worked for our family for about 35 years. He's, he's a white guy. When we would go to places and we would uh, do things for the farm, when we would encounter either governmental officials or we would encounter, uh, say, uh, trying to purchase stuff for the livestock, it was automatically assumed that the white gentleman was actually the farm owner and I was working for him. That is right throughout, again, the system. Um, there are so many inequities, especially when we talk about access to capital uh, certainly impacting uh, minorities, uh, actually people who are trying to get into farm is the issue you raised, Paul, about access to land uh, and certainly land tenure. Those are big issues. I know Chantel has done a lot of work around that. Ele Ele Ebony Alexander uh, with the um, uh, Black Families Land Trust um, and certainly uh, many people here in the Commonwealth of Virginia are addressing land tenure issues uh, and air property issues. But having seen discrimination as a farmer on the farmer end, uh, we look to uh, state and federal policies to try to address some of these issues. And very quickly, I just wanted to say that again, uh, when I went to USDA, there was another picture in there that here I am, the state director of USDA and uh, an agency designed to help farmers, to help all farmers. And let me just say this, if USDA closes doors today, Farmers across the United States 
would just go out of, I mean, they would be out of business, regardless of how large of a farm farmer you are, producer, or how small, farmers across the United States will go out of, out of business. But here's the point. USDA has been closed to many black farmers since its inception. So a lot of the things that actually can benefit a lot of the farmers hadn't been there for a lot of the minority farmers. And those are the things that we have to hold USDA accountable for. But let me share this story quickly and I'll uh, pass it on. But uh, as I was the state director of uh, USDA uh, rural development, shortly after I arrived on my, my job, a couple of weeks in, months in, making some changes, apparently we stepped on some toes when you try to address issues around equity and uh, fairness um, in the distribution and allocation of funds. Uh, there's a picture there where one day I come to my office, my office, and my office had been ransacked. So pictures of President Obama, Secretary Vilsack at the time, they were taken down, my office. So again, there are issues, not only that producers and black farmers uh, encounter, uh, you know, when trying to really engage in this um, uh, profession of agriculture, but also when you get in leadership roles and start talking about issues, and we need to talk about these issues of discrimination, because that's exactly what we're talking about when we talk about food justice. I mean, we really need to, one, acknowledge that there is an issue and a talk about the issue. But again, let's find some solutions and we'll talk about solutions going forward. All right, terrific, Basil, thank you so much. Um, Chantel, I was hoping you might say uh, a little bit more about some of the uh, ongoing local uh, uh, initiatives that Cultivate and Food Justice Network are involved in. And then after that, we've got uh, something a little different. We're going to, uh, we have a few poll questions for our uh, audience. Awesome. Yeah. And it's been really amazing to sit uh, on this panel, something that Christiane was speaking to about farm workers. Um, locally, we are still in a pandemic. I mean, we're in a pandemic everywhere. Um, but one of the things that came up was our migrant farm workers were having issues, first of all, accessing food. And then Christiane spoke to uh, healthcare access during a pandemic is virtually uh, non-existent. And one of the things that Cultivate did um, when we attended these like regional farm, migrant farm worker calls is thinking about ways to have somewhat of a mutual aid network for our farm worker um, in, in our area. And so uh, we were able to get in contact with UVA Health. Um, right now we're still on calls to um, plan testing, which has been going on. Um, it's been really hard to get, you know, a lot of COVID tests out to the farms across the area. Um, it's also hard for those folks to come to us. Um, so that's one thing that I really wanted to speak to because there's so many things that as a locality we've been able to like respond to during our pandemic, really kind of us using these mutual aid um, networks, using you know, strategies that we know, community members know for how you really build resilience and outlast like tragedies or pandemic or trauma that happens. Um, specifically, I also wanted to speak a little bit to our COVID wraparound services uh, that we started, mostly because black and brown people are disproportionately impacted by COVID. Uh, we also know these people are bearing the brunt of health diet related illnesses. Um, we also know that food access in Charlottesville, which is one in six, uh, before the pandemic, uh, folks are struggling with access to, to healthy food has gotten even worse. And so when you have a pandemic coming down on communities that are already facing health disparities um, and that are already kind of, for lack of better words, like living in uh, food environments that are the byproducts of food apartheid or the way in which our city has built policies and designed our neighborhoods, um, there's really nothing else left to do but take direct action specifically in a pandemic. And so some of our work um, locally, which we've just been able to kick back up with these long-term policy changes, actually we had to hit the pause button and say that we're gonna be a direct um, you know, aid, emergency aid uh, coalition right now. We're really gonna meet the needs of our community members because without them, uh, we don't have people at the table to push these policies. We don't have community members that can come 
to city council meetings or school board meetings and continue to talk about these issues. So it's really important for us to take care of our family and our friends in this point in time. Um, and so that's just a little snippet of, of what we've been able to do. Paul, I'm so thankful for you because I know you know my work intimately. And so anytime you feel like Chantel's forgetting to talk about something, please, please ask me that question directly. Well, I do, Chantel, I'll, I'll take you up on that. Um, one of the exciting developments that was unveiled this week, and this was um, a project uh, a, a long time uh, in the works, uh, is a uh, texting service, a text message service uh, that enables people simply to text a number and get information about uh, how they can access food. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that and then also about the uh, latest uh, uh, lobbying effort, activist uh, uh, um, um, uh, pressure effort to uh, influence policy here in Charlottesville? Sure, yeah, the text messaging service, we really started that because like I said, in Charlottesville, we have a terrible food insecurity rate and that's kind of given birth to about 50 different programs, <laughs> organizations that are working in Charlottesville that are trying to solve it. Um, and as you can imagine, navigating all those resources as a person that has, they have different times during the pandemic, they shifted their hours. Um, there are different requirements from tapping into that, those, uh, those resources. And so we developed the text messaging service so people can just text their zip code um, it, in the day that they wanna receive services to align. It's for the entire health district. So not only the city, but all the counties. Um, and we are able to do that because we are this coalition. We have a lot of partners. We're really grateful about that. Um, more recently, we have been able to kickstart our, our policy engine back up. And so right now we're in kind of full throttle with our city strategic planning, with our school board's budget um, planning that's coming up. And we're really pushing for healthy school meals. This has been on our, our uh, ticket for a very, very long time. Uh, one in two students in Charlottesville City Schools qualify for free and reduced lunch. Uh, we already know that our lunch uh, line is, is not the best that it can be. Um, and so we've been able to uh, really use this moment in time to say, we need to start transforming city schools. So once we open back up, this lunch line looks different. Um, we know that it's been really incredibly hard to get food into the communities during the pandemic. Uh, a lot of kids are missing meals right now um, because they couldn't catch that bus or because we're really limited by um, where that lunch program can go and distribute in the USDA waivers that come in. Uh, we're really trying to push for a transformation now, uh, even though it is a, a critical time with funding. Uh, people have been doing this work for a really long time. And so we're really excited to potentially get that policy pushed through and changed. Fantastic, Chantel. Thank you so much. And speaking about food access, we actually have uh, several poll questions to share with you, um, including about food access, because we're interested in, um, in your perspective. Uh, and after this, we're going to turn to some uh, of the questions uh, that you have all uh, submitted audience members. So um, Ashley, if you can um, share the first of our polls. Do you know anyone personally who faces food insecurity? And we don't expect that people know uh, uh, the exact USDA definition, but we wanted to, to get your responses to this. All right, almost 50-50, 49% say yes, 51% say no. Uh, Ashley, our second question, and this is more of a quiz, sorry. In 2019, prior to the pandemic, what do you think is the percentage of American households categorized by the federal government as being food insecure? 3%, 6.5%, 10.5%, or 18%? I don't know if we're allowed to speak when they're doing this poll. But you can speak. That one in two people, that like surprises me and doesn't surprise me at the same time. It's really hard to talk about, you know, if you are struggling with food, that is something that's a, an intimate topic. So it doesn't necessarily surprise me, but I was, I was thinking it would, it would be a higher number. That knew somebody struggling. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. 56% say 18, 
38% say 10.5. In 2019, prior, obviously, to the pandemic, it was 10.5% of American households categorized by the U.S. Department of Agriculture of living uh, as living in a condition of food insecurity at some point during the previous 12 months. But here's the really important uh, uh, point. That number has increased tremendously, as you might imagine from what Chantel was describing here in Charlottesville. Um, it was over 20% um, in the last year, uh, and among households with children, it was even higher. Uh, almost 30% of households with children living in a condition of food insecurity, almost 30% of American households. I want that to sink in just for a moment. As Chantel says, here in our uh, area, in the Charlottesville area, Chantel, you said one in six, we we're talking about 17%, something like that. Yeah, but that's also before the pandemic. Before the pandemic, yeah, yeah. So probably what we are seeing here is what, what we're seeing everywhere in terms of uh, uh, this just tremendous increase. And again, this, this notion that the pandemic has exposed and exacerbated problems that, that are longstanding and have been with us for, for a long time. Uh, what's our last one, Ashley? I think it's something about food values and how much we know how much do you know about who produced your food and under what conditions? This is a terrible question, I admit. It's what we call a double-barreled question. I'm asking you uh, two things at once, but uh, uh, let's see what people have to say. Almost nothing. The modal response at 43%, wow. Chantal, now I'm the one who's surprised because I thought people were gonna say a great deal or at least some. Panelists, what do you think about this? Does it surprise you? What is it? What do, what do we do with this? Christiane, you have something? Yeah, I, again, I, just like Chantel said before, it, it does and it does not surprise me. Um, I, it does surprise me because I thought that also agree with you, some will be the, the prevalent answer. Uh, but it does not surprise me from the point of view of the lack of visibility of farm workers and their lives and conditions. And I think that's what actually uh, generates a lot of uh, moral apathy towards the situation of farm workers in the country. It's really this ignorance about the living and working conditions uh, of farm workers or who even uh, these people are. They are not only uh, undocumented workers. They might be folks that have lived in Virginia or around the country in farms, uh, farmland forever, uh, in rural areas forever. Um, I also am not surprised because of the fact that many times when I talk about my work, uh, people reach the following conclusion to me. They say, oh, so you help farmers, right? And I was like, no, actually most farmers are not farm workers or do not perform farm work. That's much more common on the uh, small farm setting where yes, there are some small farmers who do field work, but most of them don't. Even, even the relatively small farmers here in Virginia from tobacco farms, uh, they might operate the truck, the tractor occasionally, but they do not do field work and they do not have um, sometimes a lot of a whole lot of sympathy for the their hardness or the, the working conditions of the folks that might be uh, vomiting after, I'm sorry to be so graphic, but after uh, working with tobacco leaves that are wet and relieve a, a level of toxi toxicity that people feel sick about it. Just because that farmer, a person who <laughs> is in the business of farming has no idea that that is something that happens. So that's my answer. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, Tanya, I think you, did you wanna weigh in? Uh it just is surprising to me. I thought this, uh, I assumed this would be a foodie crowd um, and that, that we'd have a much higher unusual percentage of people who were familiar with, with their own food system. So that was a surprise that even people who are clearly interested in food and justice, we all have so much to learn. And, okay. and 
Good, and, and it's, that's such an important point, Tanya, but what I wanna say is when we have a conversation like this, it's really easy for us to locate the individual as uh, being responsible for figuring all of this stuff out. And I think we should ask, um, why do we have a food system in which we know so little, in which it is so hard to achieve a level of transparency, to learn about our food, to learn who benefits from us being ignorant? It's not necessarily a moral fa failure on the part of us as eaters, right? It may be a moral failure on the part of a system uh, that, we, uh, that we have created. And so um, with that in mind, I want to turn to questions um, about uh, precisely this. What do we do? Um, one of the recurring questions that we've received uh, both before the panel and during the panel has to do with solutions, how to address these issues, these challenges. Uh, and uh, the way I would like to think about it is uh, in terms of policy, what do we need to see at a policy level, whether it's a national uh, or state or a local level. And we've, we've talked about all of those. So one, policy, two, um, an institutional level, and Tanya, I'm going to come back to you and uh, uh, invite you to say a few uh, more words about uh, the university, but also, Chantel, I hope we can talk about um, K through 12, public education, um, and the, the, the institution of the public schools. And then third, what can we do, what should we do as individuals, as eaters? And so I want to, I want to go around and, and invite all of you to speak to any of those questions, the institutional level, the policy level, and then the individual level. Take your pick, uh, but Basil, I wanna start with you and then go to Chantel, Tanya, and Christiane. Well, thank you, Paul. Uh, to address your question about, you know, how do we get here uh, to this situation where we know very little about our food? Um, we've actually, in the United States, uh, throughout our history, we've actually um, outsourced a lot of what we used to do at home. Uh, we've outsourced uh, not only feeding our family, but also educating our family and raising our family. So, um, and so we've, we've become uh, disconnected with you know how our food is actually produced and who's actually producing it and that that most important part under what what conditions um so you know i'm surprised at the result that actually so many people knew something about where their food comes from uh so i guess i'm i'm, I'm i take heart in that let's turn to some solutions because again um the majority of americans do not know uh where their food comes from and and how it's produced um, but let's, let's look at some solutions. Uh, it's incumbent upon decision makers and, and policy makers that they recognize that this is a big issue, not only the treatment of workers, not only uh, the discrimination that goes on economically that um, relegates individuals to uh, less nutritious food, um, and, you know, again, you, you mentioned about the, the SNAP uh, actually, again, um, being um, more funding directed toward uh, SNAP. These are big issues. We need someone, we need uh, 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 um, people that are specifically charged with the responsibility for addressing these issues of food. There is a group of people that uh, have been encouraging the new president to actually appoint a food czar, someone who is in charge of really looking at these issues from, again, from the, the producers to, again, the end consumers, really looking at how do we get good, nutritious, and healthy food into the communities uh, that, and again, um, food that's produced uh, hum humanely, uh, and again, looking at those conditions, but really getting food uh, into these communities, nutritious food, because again, uh, here at VCU, I'm in the School of Social Work, and what I spent a lot of time doing is connecting food and nutrition with also social outcomes and cognitive development, and also, um, again, educational achievement. All these things are interrelated, and certainly health, I mean, again. so. Um, one uh, big thing that we are actually calling on this new administration to do is to really appoint a food czar, someone that will be in charge. Again, not agriculture, but food. And again, um, that's you know one solution. That's one thing that we you know that we've been producing, uh, looking at. 
but also getting active with a lot of the uh, food justice, justice movements in your areas. Again, Charlottesville or the Chantel's leadership, great. Uh, here in Richmond, we have some great leaders, uh, Sharon, Sharon Davis, I mean, Deron <laughs> Chavis, I'm sorry, um, doing great work. Other uh, food justice um, um, uh, activities going on across the state of Virginia, uh, get involved, learn more about you, how your, where your food comes from and how it's produced. But again, it, it takes people to really, uh, a group, you know, a, a, a movement to really move the needle. Because again, a lot of times in these agriculture issues, we don't have videos to show some of the mistreatment that, you know, other people can see maybe in some of these other areas. And I think uh, when people would see more about, you know, again, some of these issues in agriculture, if they could, you know, if you can bring it home and it resonates, then we will get some movement here uh, in the United States as well. Terrific, man. So thank you so much. And, and, and you're so right. Uh, we, one thing that we do not have in this country is a national food policy. It right. doesn't exist. Uh, what we end up with is piecemeal put together by, uh, you know, legislative and regulatory action from across uh, the political map. It's not coordinated and it's not uh, centralized. Uh, and I also like your um, uh, uh, suggestion that we can all uh, look for and connect with and support the kind of work that uh, Food Justice Network here in Charlottesville is doing. So Chantal, um, I'll I want to ask you the same questions. Yeah, yeah. and I'll be super quick because I know we're going up on time. Um, just a quick plug for a national policy. There's a Justice for Black Farmers Act um, that is out as, as Dr. Gooden was speaking to. And that is one thing that we all could really support. Um, so I just wanted to do a quick plug for that. And then on the local level, some of the things that we're looking at, um, all, most of our work is really focused on food access. So we're like getting food on the table. Um, that doesn't mean that we're not concerned where our food is coming from. So I just wanted to like do that disclaimer because we do, we do care about the hands that grew it. And we do uh, care about the farms where it's raised at. Um, for us, it's really about land ownership. Uh, there's a lot of urban farms that are being pretty much swiped away and destroyed by um, re the redevelopment process, which is important. But we also don't have a local, you know, policy or ordinance that really protects that that land for urban agriculture for the communities that have been doing it for years. And what that looks like is Black community members saying that we want food grown in our community for our community. Have been doing it for ten over ten years. Uh, was producing 17,000 pounds of food and distributing it for free in their community, and now being and now having that um, that that resource taken away for redevelopment. And so we need stronger policies on the local level to protect that. Um, with our city schools, our nutrition department is its own call center. That means that um, our school our school budget, um, our city council budget doesn't put any money into our nutrition program at all. And so um, you, you get what you pay for. Um, not to say that we don't get reimbursed at an okay rate, but it could be better at the national level. And so policies that would push for better reimbursement for meals in our, in our city schools would be amazing. And also localities being able to make an investment um, on the local level to match that so that we can really get those programs up and running. And I'll stop it there. We do have um, policies around transportation. We have policies around affordable housing um, and how neighborhoods develop in general to really tackle this idea of food apartheid and not thinking of a neighborhood in comparison to another neighborhood in Charlottesville, but we don't have time to go through those, so. So Chantel, it almost sounds like um... For you, questions of food justice have to do with food policy, but they also have to do with education policy, housing policy, transportation policy, et cetera. Is that what I'm hearing? Absolutely. Food justice works at the intersection of, of a lot of different sectors. Always, It always has. Um, and I think when we talked about why it's so hard for people to understand it and know it and talk about it, it's because it's so entangled. Um, which makes sense. It's it's we we eat. We have to stop to eat at least three times a day. People take that for granted, but that is a lot of of resources that's going into you finding a meal and time out of your day. So, yes, 
Uh, Chantel, thank you. Tanya, I want to give you a chance to talk a little bit about uh, uh, these questions of solutions, but with an eye toward, as you noted before, uh, UVA as an institutional actor with a long historical legacy, uh, but also a neighbor. I mean, the university is part of this community. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the kind of work that we are all doing at UVA? Yeah, thank you, Paul. Um, it's it's an interesting and complicated story, so I'm, I'm going to have to pick and choose a few things here. But um, for people, for people who you know who are listening, who are alumni of universe of the university, they may not know that the culture at, of of um, adulation of Jefferson has radically shifted. Um, towards one where light is being shown on the darker reality of, of not only his personal life, but also the public life and, and what happened at the university. And so, for example, on the corner now, you can find the Memorial to Enslaved Laborers, which reveals a truth that many students at the university were told a different story that there had never been enslaved laborers at, uni at the university. But now we do know the truth um, and we're discovering more as we go that there were more than 4,000 enslaved people who built and maintained every aspect of life at the university. Why do I say this? Why do I mention this? It's because it's acknowledging and emphasizing that one of the most important things that a university and our university in particular can do to encourage a just and sustainable food system is that we must, as I said earlier, look inward and try to take care of our own house and put it in order. And so we are at a time of reckoning with this legacy that's being still felt in the region. Um, and, and so what do we do as an institution of learning? Well, one of the first things is that we do need to learn and we need to create opportunities for others to learn. One of the ways uh, we have done, this is one of our, our, our um, food action goals in the sustainable sustainability plan is to increase awareness about sustainable and just food systems to help translate that awareness into uh, informed choices and opportunities for direct participation. So one of the things we did for the bicentennial was to host a day and a half symposium um, called the, the Future of Our Food System from Slavery to Sovereignty. And over 200, we brought in over 200 people from Virginia and beyond, 16 national leaders in the food justice movement to discuss continuing inequities in our food system and ways that communities like what Chantel is doing at the local level, addressing those inequities, one step, five steps at a time. Um, an additional highlight of that symposium that I want to mention because there have been questions about um, our Native American uh, tribes here in Virginia, and we now have seven federally recognized tribes. One of them is the Monacan. And you may have seen slides in, in the slideshow, and there were two of the I, what's called the I Collective, an autonomous group of indigenous chefs and activists and herbalists, knowledge keepers who gifted us and gave us an unparalleled experience of a feast that had been foraged at a local farm and then prepared in um, ancestral foodways, um, cooked over an open fire. And um, they, there were flavors in that. I mentioned this because from the I Collective's perspective, what they shared with us over lunch is their perspective on food justice is that food, it's what Basil talked about earlier, is it is about the connection of us to our food and to the land that connect that that created that food and they made a point of saying that you have likely never tasted food that tastes like this because you've never cooked it this way with the land that it comes from so um, we can do things like that here at the university that can be powerful that can change people's perspective i think one of the most important things that we can do long term to change the system is to use our power of the purse. And we do have a very important goal at UVA to increase the percentage of sustainable food and beverages on grounds. We, we now have a specific measurable goal of reaching 50% by UVA dining 
uh, a 50% food expenditure on sustainable foods, which includes local um, by 2030. And if we include the health system and garden dining, we are aiming for an overall expenditure on sustainable foods to 30% because UVA dining is actually much further ahead than the other two. So how does this help food justice? One of the ways that we have identified and with input uh, from the Charlottesville Food Justice Network and, and their larger network of black and brown farmers in Virginia is we are identifying a, an important need and opportunity where we can work to di help increase the diversity and equity within the supply chain, the food supply chain that is operative at UVA. And it's very tough for any of you alumni who know are working in supply chains, you know that this is really difficult to change, but we are, we are starting to make these changes and we are committed to not only increasing the supply of foods available from, um, from local, but specifically black, indigenous, Latinx, and, and specifically, even more specifically, those black and brown indigenous and farmers in Virginia who have historically been marginalized. We have a webinar next week, in fact, uh, Farm to University webinar, where we are specifically looking at how can we open up um, equitable pathways to the supply chain for UVA and other universities. So imagine, I'll give you these numbers and, and your minds might explode, mine always does, that our annual food spend is around $11 million. And we, we serve about 2 million meals each year. So imagine, if you will, that UVA and let's say a few other universities and others are working with us in this effort as well, say that we only, let's say we only commit 5% of that to local and to Virginia and to black and indigenous farmers. It could change lives, it could save farmland, it could create new careers. Um, and, and it could change the way we think about our food in Virginia. So um, I'm, I'm sensing I'm probably out of time here, but I just wanna leave you with that image that we have tremendous power, we need to use it. And there's a group of us at UVA that are committed to helping make that happen. Yes, Tanya, thank you so much. And, and I think you've really uh, made the point well that what an institution like the University of Virginia does matters. Uh, it sends a message, it sends a signal, but it can also uh, have real material uh, uh, effects on, on uh, particularly farmers in this uh, and surrounding areas. Um, you mentioned the University of Virginia's food action plan. And let me just say the fact that the University of Virginia has a food action plan is a really big deal because it represents us doing what I suggested at the very top of, the, uh, uh, of, of today's panel, uh, we think about, which is uh, what our values are and how we enact those values in the choices that we make around food. Um, in our last uh, four minutes, I'm going to invite each of you to very quickly lightning round, parting words, ideas, thoughts. Uh, what do you want the audience to come away with? And we'll begin, Christian, with you. Uh, you have uh, just under a minute each. Go. Okay, I was very taken by James Baldwin documentary. So I have two, I was asked to choose um, some phrases. So I have two from that documentary that I would like to share with you, leave you to reflect upon them. One um, is from a Dostoyevsky, the Russian author, uh, one of his books, and it says, vile as I am, I don't believe in the wagons that bring bread to humanity. For the wagons that bring bread to humanity may coldly exclude a considerable part of humanity from enjoying what is brought. The second uh, sentence is from Baldwin himself. And it says, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. So um, just because I did not have an opportunity to talk about policy and I have a huge disclaimer, which is um, I'm talking, uh, those are my own views, not the views of the Virginia Farm Workers Program or the Legal Aid Society that I belong to. Uh, uh, political engagement is very important. So please, uh, it's, it's in the horizon. Uh, 
considering the bust of Cesar Chavez in the White House now, is in the horizon immigration reform. So uh, let your representatives uh, know what are your opinions in the matter. When they are ready to vote or propose legislation, please get engaged, contact your representatives. Uh, same here in Virginia for overtime, farm workers do not have right to overtime. So it's about time for them to have those rights. Um, and I'll leave you with that because there is also federal regulations regard uh, work visas, but these I, I imagine that will be addressed during immigration reform as well. If you want to contact me for more details, my email will be shared and or to volunteer to our organization and all these wonderful organizations and ideas that were provided before. Thank you so much for joining us today. Terrific, Christian, thank you very much. And indeed, uh, everybody attending today's panel will get a follow-up email with some references and links uh, that they can use. Chantel, can we go to you and then Basil? Lightning round, parting words. Uh, parting words, um, Fannie Lou Hamer, we're not free until everybody's free. Um, and so my parting words is, is just that, to keep pushing for policies at the state, federal, and your local level. Um, and to understand that this is not a, com a competition. It's not farm workers against black farmers, against indigenous farmers. It, this is not um, what, what our work is about. This is not, that's not what food justice means and, and what I grew up to understand um, in, in my um, black traditions, I guess, of growing up as a food justice family. Um, and so I just wanna keep that in mind. If people wanna get in contact with me, I did put my uh, email in the chat. You can also visit us at cultivatecharlottesville.org. Um, Thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Chantel. Basil. Uh, uh, parting words. Um, the uh, civil rights activist, Vernon Johns, actually, he was a, a activist and a pastor before Martin Luther King became uh, the pastor in, in Montgomery. Um, his, his quote was that, if you see a good fight, get in it. And really, he said, you know, really not, you know, a physical fight, but just, you know, if you see a, a cause. And what I just want to leave you with is that I want each of us to recognize the power. I want the audience, I want the students, I want the community members to recognize the power that they possess to change the system. It's only when people really speak up. And, and as Tanya indicated, you know, again, you can demand, you know, where your food comes from. You can really, you know, you can see the food system is changing you know, with some of the big players getting into the food system, Amazon, you can change the food system. You can change the way individuals are treated. And, uh, but it, it takes us all uh, getting behind, you know, putting our shoulder to the wheel. And so please recognize the power that you have as an individual to make that change and get involved. Excellent. Tanya, you got maybe 30 seconds for us? All right, I'll go for it. Um, I would just make an appeal to all of our alumni who um, may know that alumni count a great deal in, in the um, Board of Visitors and the President's um, mind. And so we would ask you to let the, the President Ryan and the Board of Visitors know that you want UVA to be a leader in sustainable and just food. Thank Terrific. you. Tanya, thank you so much. And I would just add to what everybody has said. We are all eaters. We are all part of the food system. We all get to make decisions and choices uh, and uh, let us think about how those choices uh, uh, affect food justice broadly, broadly construed. I wanna thank all of our panelists. I wanna thank the audience for fantastic. We've been doing these pandemic webinars for like a year. I have to say these questions that I've been looking at the best in a year of webinars. So I wanna thank the audience for really wonderful questions. I'm sorry, we did not get uh, to more of them. I wanna turn things back now to Rebecca Deeds of Morgan. Thanks so much, Paul. Um, thanks everyone for attending this program. Um, so many wonderful questions came in from the audience. We'll be saving the chat and following up with a blog post um, that Paul will be leading for Lifetime Learnings, Our Thoughts from the Lawn blog. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to get to more of those questions that way. Um, you can also check out more of Morvin's programs at morvin.virginia.edu 
sign up for our listserv to get more information for continuing this conversation about food justice. Um, there's some resource links in the chat feature as well, and we'll be following up um, with more resources via email. Um, thank you so much for, for attending this program and, um, and thank you to all of our panelists.